that. Crossing family, it is so good to be with each and every single one of you. I am so glad you're here. I've missed you, and I'm excited to be able to spend some time with you today, and I don't know what brought you in. I don't know the circumstances surrounding you coming. Some of you are navigating probably a really rough time in your life right now. You had a rough week. Some of you because of things that are happening to you relationally. Some of you because of the heartbreaking stuff you're seeing in the news. And I just want you to know you made one of the best decisions that you could make to surround yourself with the people of God, to spend time in the Word of God and allow the Spirit of God to move in your life, which is the only hope that this broken world is going to have, is that people getting connected with God through his Holy Spirit and his church and his word. And so I'm just so glad, uh, so glad that you're here. I have to do this. This is a little bit, um, I, I just feel compelled to do it. When I was growing up, I went to a really small church, and they had a time in the service where they did prayer requests, and you just raised your hand, and everybody heard your prayer request, and then they made a list, and they prayed for it. And then they also did a thing uh, called this. Anybody in here? Raise your hand if you know what this stands for. I just want to know the people who grew up in church. Okay. Uh, this stands for praise the Lord. And there were these moments where we had the PTLs of the service where you got to say something good that's going on in your life. And that was your praise the Lord moment. And we acknowledged those like in the prayer time. And uh, I have a PTL thing happening for me this weekend. Um, so uh, I, wanted, I wanted to walk uh, a, a daughter down the aisle. Like that was something I wanted, you know, I wanted on my, on my list of things. And uh, my stepdaughter Kennedy has an incredible dad. And so when she got married, he got the honor, and he should have, to walk her down the aisle. I got the distinct honor of officiating the wedding. But when Jennifer and I were having kids, the first two came out were boys, and we just couldn't risk a third because we're going to have to feed them. And uh, uh, three Hensels is, you know, an Escalade payment when it comes to a food bill. And so, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to stop for budgetary reasons. And so that was kind of like, you know, well, there goes that dream. Well, um, a girl named Lisa, who I've talked about before, um, uh, she lived with us for a year. She reached out about four months ago, and she said, hey, um, I'm getting married up in Chicago over Memorial Day weekend, and Ben Elifritz, one of my dear friends, our Macomb campus pastor, is officiating the ceremony, but she asked me if I get a walker down the aisle, and uh, I said yes immediately, and then I hung up the phone, I went to my bedroom, and I just bawled. I just bawled because only God can just answer the deepest desires of your heart in unexplained ways, and just one small act of obedience from my wife bringing Lisa into our house created the opportunity for me to do something that was heavy on my heart, and so I just, I feel like I owe it to God to just declare his favor over my life and that God answers prayers and he hears us and he knows what we want. In fact, scripture commands this. Look what it says in Psalm chapter 40. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. So I felt like I should. I do not seal my lips, uh, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. He goes on in 1 Chronicles to say this, what you and I are supposed to do. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And I felt like it would be wrong as your pastor to not just acknowledge where God has been moving in my life. And that is one of the ways that people who don't have a relationship with Jesus can find a relationship with Jesus is when we declare how God is moving in our lives and how you can have that intimate, personal relationship with him. So uh, I had to get that out of the way because I just felt like I owed it to him, so thank you for uh, indulging me in that. I wanna welcome you from all of our different locations. I'm so glad you're here, and if you're brand new to the church, we're in a sermon series called Chasing Shades, and Jerry did an incredible job last week of introducing the, the book of Ecclesiastes, and he talked about a merry-go-round and how we can get on the merry-go-round of life, and you go round and round and round, but you don't go anywhere. It leaves you right where it found you, only with less money in your pocket. And I could not stop what he was preaching of this gif. You guys have seen it, okay? <laughs> All right, and listen, uh, tell me, is this not us? Uh, we've fallen off the ride, but we're not letting go. Isn't that it, we're, uh, we're still hanging on. Uh, we're in a bad relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We know it's over, but we're still 
hanging on. We know it's not good. Uh, Our jobs, our money, our stuff hasn't made us any more happy, any more fulfilled, but there we are, still hanging on. Our marriage is in a rough patch. We know that the trajectory we're on isn't good, but we still keep running the passive aggressive play. We still keep doing the angry fit throwing play. We're still hanging on. And I, I just, I just want to tell you, let go, okay? Just let go. Stop. This merry-go-round won't solve anything. All you're going to get now is rug burn, okay? <laughs> All right? I was talking to Jerry about this on Monday, that this sermon series uh, for me comes from a very pastoral place. Um. I see so much pain and brokenness day in and day out. I hear stories each week that are just gut-wrenching. And uh, some of the worst pain that I experience is what I call one-day pain. Everybody say one-day pain. Uh, You know what one-day pain is. Somebody you love, uh, they're getting ready to walk down a road, and you know that when they walk down that road, one day, they're going to experience an awful lot of pain. Uh, We've all seen people on the one-day pain train. That schedule, that business practice, that belief system, that relationship, that purchase, that uncontrolled emotion is one day going to cause them an awful lot of pain. The list could go on and on, and some of us, we could provide testimony if we were to pass the mic around at each of our locations and talk about the one-day pain that you've experienced in your life, that you had all of these road signs, all of these people yelling, turn around, but you just kept going. In fact, you increased the speed instead of slowing down, and one day, it all came crashing down. This sermon series is designed to keep you from one day pain. It comes from a place with a, of a, a sincere desire to help you learn from the wisdom of God and apply it in your life. In education, there is a model of learning called the Bark Model. And all of you teachers, don't noose me over this. Just, I know I'm not a teacher, and you're like, well, that one was so good back when. Okay, just. Track with me, okay? It'll make sense. Bark, visual, auditory, reading and writing, and kinesthetic. And you guys, you guys are all smart. You, you get all this. Visual, it's people who are better able to uh, retain information when it's displayed and presented on graphs and charts and diagrams. Uh, auditory learners are people that it makes more sense to them when they hear it, when it's presented to them vocally. When they hear it, they begin to engage at a higher level. Uh, reading and writing is when they focus on the written word, text-heavy resources. Uh, they're typically note-takers. And then there's the kinesthetic learners. When they physically engage, when they take an active role, employing their senses during the hands-on approach seals in the information. And that's why when we preach, we try to make sure that we're hitting as many of those as possible. The one we can't do is the kinesthetic one. You have to do that one when you leave. You have to trust God. You have to take a step of faith and go, I'm gonna apply what I learned visually, auditorily, through reading and writing, and I'm gonna put it into play in my life and watch the truth of God be revealed through my actions kinesthetically. And uh, we, we try to employ all of these methods. Uh, however, there are some things that can only be learned kinesthetically. Like, uh, I could, all of us right now, you could learn how to uh, change a tire on any four of those. Like, uh, you, could, uh, you, know, you could watch all a slideshow on how to change a tire. You could go out. For the most part, I mean, I wouldn't drive it, but most of you, you could put the tire on, right? Uh, you, could, uh, you could hear someone talk you through it, and some of you are like, oh yeah, not a problem, go out, spin it on, you're good to go. Some of you, you could, you know, you pull out the instruction manual, and you, you're like, how many Newtons of torque? And everybody's like, when you can't turn it anymore, that's when it's good, right? But you can do all four of those when it comes to changing a tire, but when it comes to riding a bike, The only way to learn how to ride a bike is kinesthetically. It's actually getting on the bike. Can you imagine someone saying, have you ridden a bike before? No, but I've read all the books about it. You're like, okay, it's a steep hill, hold on, all right? (laughs) I mean, yeah, you just can't, you have to, well, when it comes to life, I want you as often as possible 
to avoid having to learn experientially. I want you to learn visually by watching the lives of other Christians around you or people who aren't following Jesus and seeing what happens. I want you to pay close attention and listen to the people around you proclaiming wisdom and pointing you to the truth of God's word and listening to people who have already traveled down that road and can tell you what's right or what's wrong and how that's gonna impact you. That's how people can spot one day pain because they've already been down that. They had some day pain and they're trying to prevent you from one day pain. I want you to learn about life through reading and taking notes of those who have gone before you. And if you have to learn life lessons experientially, I want you to choose to engage experientially in areas where other people around you have experienced massive success, or at least have an incredible safety net. Now, uh, because experience is a profound teacher, it will teach, but the price tag is high. And I know that that's not, life is not that simple. Sometimes it's hard and you're gonna have to do backflips from time to time. And I know that's tough, but when you have to find yourself in a moment where you have to do a backflip, have a safety net. Uh, true story, I want to be able to do a standing backflip. I've wanted to know how to do a standing backflip since high school. And I practice. And I have yet to fully succeed, okay? Now, you know why I'm still standing here and not, you know, didn't have to get wheeled up here? It's because I don't practice in the front yard, <laughs> okay? I pick a place that has, so I, I practice when, when, when you know, campus passes or, or kids want to go to a trampoline park, I go into the foam pit. Uh, I don't do it on the trampoline because, you know, that bounces back and, you know, I don't, that's a lot of weight on one little neck, okay? Uh, but listen, if you take me to your backyard pool and you get on your diving board, I will pull off a beautiful backflip with toes pointed, okay? Legit. I just, I'm not at a point yet where I'm gonna like, you know, stand in your front yard and jump up and grab my knees. I'm just not ready there. So you can try the bigger things if you have a better safety net. Solomon is coming to you and coming to me from both the past and the future to give you an, an, the ability to learn without having to practice kinesthetically. He's saying, I'm coming to you from the past and the future. He's coming to you from the past because he's already been there, done that, and he knows the outcome. But he's also coming to you from the future because if you were to take every one of your wildest dreams and ambitions and multiply them by 10,000, you still wouldn't be in the ballpark of the pleasure that he experienced. And he found all of them hollow. I want you to pay close attention to him. I want you to learn from him. I want you to lean in to the blessing that God is trying to give you because if you don't, it will cost you what you treasure most. It will cost you time and relationships. It will rob you of purpose and meaning. We did this sermon survey a while back and this is what you said. In our church, 53% of us are searching for purpose and meaning. 60%, six out of 10 of you, need help handling stress. 40% of you are dealing with burnout. 40%, four in 10 of us, are dealing with an identity crisis. In short, we don't know who we are, we don't know why we are, and we are stressing and burning ourselves out in the process. That's why we're preaching about chasing shades. It's because I want you to take in Solomon's wisdom and apply it in your life and experience the blessing. The chapter I'm about to talk to you is, about, is all about the P's. It is pleasure, projects, possessions, power, profession, and position. I'm not gonna say that fast because p -p -p please just p -p -p preach this sermon, okay? Now you'll remember it. Ecclesiastes chapter two, I'm gonna walk you through the whole chapter. So if you brought your Bible, use it. Here we go. I said to myself, this is Solomon, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be, everybody help me out. Ooh, that's interesting. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself up with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. 
I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. Solomon seeks the pleasure of substances and he doesn't find meaning and purpose at the bottom of the bottle. He doesn't find escape because it's waiting for him when he sobers up. That's why I'm so glad our church at many of our locations has a region ministry because it helps people overcome and recapture what drugs, alcohol, and pills have taken. It helps them find victory and meaning in Christ Jesus. So Solomon tries uh, pleasure in the bottle, doesn't find it there. Then he tries laughter, and he doesn't find it there either. All the comedians, all the Netflix specials can, can never permanently replace the realities of this world. You can laugh as much as you want. You can try to find ways to keep yourself away from the pain and sorrow and the misery, but eventually it's gonna come. It, too, is meaningless. So then he goes on, chapter two, verse four through six. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. So he's tried pleasure, he's tried uh, uh, he's tried wine, didn't find it. Tried laughter, didn't find it. You know what I'll do? I'll just build great things. And that is exactly what he did. He built absolutely beautiful things. Uh, he built uh, the temple of God, and it took him seven years to build it. Then he went to build uh, his own house, and it took him 14. It says something about his relationship with God, that the house of God was only worth half of the time that he spent for his building his own house. But uh, you know, some of you can relate. You're like, man, I've been waiting for my husband to put outlet covers on our house for about 13 years. You're like, I get it, I understand how it happens. And uh, I just want you to know this, uh, all those things that he built, you can still touch them to this day. Uh, in 2023, our church is gonna be going to Israel, you're gonna get some information about that, and you're gonna be able to actually physically touch the foundation stones that he put in place for the temple. And you're gonna be amazed at the wisdom that it must have taken to figure out how to get those things into place. You can go there and 3,000 years later, they're still there, but they don't have any meaning in them. Have you ever met somebody, raise your hand if you know somebody who's built a house? Oh, those people are the worst, aren't they? Um, probably, like they're convinced that everybody cares. Right? Have you met the, look at these pictures, and this is how we did our electrical stuff, and I did this cool thing with the plumbing, and here's our cool sound system. Like, oh man, so it like makes sound and stuff? Cool, dude. Right? You've met those people. Yeah, and then, then after they get done with their house, they pour, they have the wet concrete, and they all put their name in it. And like 40 years later, you can't even see what the name is. Like, who's that? I don't know. It's the idiot who didn't put a light in the pantry. Right? It's like, what's the, what's the deal with this dude? Right? Look, look I, I just, uh, our, every time we get money, it has to go somewhere. So we've been saving up to do a remodel on our house, and then the roof leaked. Uh, <laughs> okay? And um, uh, I put really cool shingles on my house because I wanted a metal roof, but I was pretty sure my neighbors would get upset if I put a regular metal roof. So I found uh, the, the metal roof that makes it look like real shingles. And I spent all of this money to fix my roof and nobody comes, nobody, nobody has come by my house and be like, those shingles look awesome. No, they don't even know I re-shingled my roof. They don't even care. I try to tell them. And you know, see, though, you know what, you're not gonna believe this. That thing that you can barely see right there, right there, look real careful, you see that? That's actually metal. They're not going, oh, I'd like to accept Jesus. You're so, tell me more, Copernicus, right? They never, no, I mean, there's like, okay, cool, cool flex, man. I'm like, well, I didn't just do it there. I did it there, too. I did the whole roof. They're like, okay, cool, man. And I'm super pumped about the project, and nobody cares. And whenever I sell that house, there's going to be some guy going, yeah, some dude put all this money in the metal on the roof, and his cabinets don't match. What, okay, all right, it's gonna, you, you've been there. Some of you, you're boiling your life down to how good your yard looks or how nice your living room enhances conversations and we went with the vaulted ceiling so that way when people come in you can hear the laughter reverberate through the drywall but you're a mean person so nobody ever comes over to your house. <laughs> and he's saying, it's not there. Oh, look what he says, Ecclesiastes 2 verse seven through eight. 
I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. Here he talks about power, possession, and pleasure. He has employees for every task. He has a gardener and a pool boy and a cup bearer and a coffee maker and a clothes picker router and a clothes ironer. He has them all. And it's not there. He has all the flocks and herds you could ever want. Uh, One time when he dedicates the temple, he slaughters 22,000 cows, 120,000 sheep and goats. That's just what he sacrificed to God. That's not what he had in his possession. As for his sound system, he has the original surround sound. He has people that are like his walking soundtrack. And he's like, do the Bruno, okay? And they're like, we don't talk about Bruno, no. And they're like, oh, that's cool, right? That's all he has. He's living it up. It's, you know, instead of Dolby, it's Solomon surround sound. As for money, he was making 2.7 million a day. As for sex, 700 wives, 300 concubines. This is a man who has all the money, all the toys, all the power, and all the sex you could ever want. And he comes to one conclusion, church. Meaningless. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes verse 9. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And all of my and in all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for all of my toil. Here we see position and power. He's the best, the greatest. No one compares to him before or will come after him. He is the undisputable goat, the greatest of all time. No one could deny him. Absolute power. He's at the pinnacle. No one tells him no. Nothing's out of reach. Nothing costs too much. And he says, meaningless. Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey made this statement at a graduation uh, ceremony where he was uh, the keynote speaker. I wish people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame so they could see that it is not where you are going to find your sense of completion. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 11. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what had I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained other the sun. After all this, all the pleasure, all the possessions, all the power, all the position, all the projects, it's meaningless. He's lived a selfish life, a life dedicated to himself, and it did not satisfy He drank deeply of all that the world had to offer, and yet he was still hungry and thirsty. It never quenched. It never filled. Verses 12 through 16. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly, and what more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks around in the darkness, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is, everybody help me out, meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must Now he comes and realizes that death awaits us all. It comes for everyone, the wise and the fool. And if this life is all there is, this life can't be it because he has searched the heights and depths of it and found it meaningless. And he keeps going. You're like, man, I'm glad we came here. We needed to pick me up, Clayton. Appreciate this. 17 through 19. So I hated life. 
because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Those of you who are older, who put a little bit of money aside, you're going, man, I worked my whole life for this and I'm gonna turn it over to the kid who's wearing skinny jeans and I don't know. I just don't. He realizes that eventually everything he has is gonna belong to someone else. He realizes he can't take it with him. And those coming after him may squander what took his entire life of toil to set aside. Or they could take what was given to them and they could waste their entire lives trying to find meaning in it. He's depressed. And he keeps going. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. He turns to your profession. He goes, how did you get the big pile that you have that you're gonna leave to your kids? Oh, I remember how you got it. Uh, You got it by giving all of your days and all of your life to a job. And you piled it high and you had your success, but you, you got up early and you stayed up late, but you neglected your health and your marriage and you neglected your kids. You burnt yourself out. You stretched yourself out. You run on empty. You fill yourself up through the drive through window only to find yourself weighed down with grief and pain. You can't even sleep because you've been striving for a profession that does not satisfy. You hear people talk all the time about finding the job that they want, that they were meant for doesn't exist. You were meant for God. That's what you were meant for. You were meant for that. You may enjoy what you do. Cool. Great. But if you're trying to find your meaning in that, not there, man. Look what he says. Something turns here. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him who can eat or find enjoyment. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness, but to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Here is where he gives us the answer. It is when you take the things of the lower story and you aim them at heaven, when you aim them at the upper story, that is where you find your meaning and purpose. It is when the things that God has given you here on earth are leveraged for eternity. It's when you eat and drink with friends to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's when you invite people over and you have something to drink to put a cheers together for God and his favor over your life, his protection and his provision. It's when you take your position and you leverage it to point people to Jesus at work. It's when you come, uh, become the boss that prays for his employees and hopes that one day you get to join them in the baptistry and baptize your employees. Your job isn't to employ as many people as possible and to grow as big as possible, but you see yourself as a boss going, I'm so glad I get the opportunity to employ people and treat them well so that way I can point them to Jesus who made it all possible. It's when you build your house with the hope of entertaining the young and the orphan, the refuge and the distraught and the questioning, and you go, we have more rooms in our house than we have people. I wonder if there's people who need a room. And you start bringing people in and loving them and showing them the ways of Christ. It's when you were getting ready for the summer. It's when you turn your camper or your lake house into an opportunity to be a ministry retreat or to invest in a young couple who are trying to figure out how to navigate the challenges of marriage. It's when you take your possessions and you turn them over and try and make them a gift to the kingdom of God to be leveraged to bring people into the kingdom of God. It's when you decide to see your work as an opportunity to show off how good God 
God is when you want to be the very best employee so that way your boss is scratching your head and saying, why do you show up early? Why do you stay late? And why do you work harder than everybody else? And you, you look at your boss and you go, it's because I'm not working for you. Because the Bible tells me to do it all as if I was doing it unto God. When you become that kind of person, that's where it finds meaning. I'm doing this job to point people to Jesus. Now, how do I wrap this all up? I'm huge. I'm ginormous. I, I can't even, fa- for those of you at other locations, it's hard. I'm just a big old dude. And I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot find clothes that fit me. It is one of the most impossible things on planet Earth. And uh, it's incredibly frustrating because I want to look nice when I go places, and all the clothes that I end up buying just are frumpy. And um, so my wife put me on Stitch Fix, and for the longest time, we were able to get a whole bunch of outfits that kind of made me look decent when I stand in front of you because I get insecure about it. And uh, the problem is they're really good at finding me pants and sweaters. And if you'll remember last year, I preached uh, through the summer uh, in sweaters. And uh, when you're my size, that's a lot of sweat, okay? I'm getting dehydrated, can't get enough in my system. And here's the thing, everybody I meet says, oh, you should try this store. No, man, it doesn't have it, it just doesn't. And then you, oh, you should try this one, doesn't have it. Uh, like seven years ago, we went to Vegas, uh, and uh, everybody's like, oh, we're gonna go shopping. Uh, I bought a cigar and just sat outside, because there's like nothing, I, 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 I talked to people on the street about Jesus and watched the magicians and you know, tried to sing a couple tunes with the street guys, but um, there ain't nothing in there. And people will convince me, you've got to come in here. They'll have stuff in your size. I walk in, go to it, takes me about two seconds. Nope. And then they'll say this, as if I've never heard this before. Have you ever tried a big and tall store? The thought never crossed my mind. Here I am, big and tall my whole life, and I never even thought to Google it, not once. Yeah, I've been to all of them. All of those stores are big, not tall. I mean, I could put a couple poles and a family of five could sleep in whatever shirt they want to give me. That's it, okay? And it's like incredibly frustrating because I I, I want to look nice, I don't want to look frumpy, and I get so tired of preaching in sweaters in the summer. This past weekend, uh, uh, we went somewhere, and guess what everybody on 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 the trip wanted to do? They wanted to shop, okay? So I'm like, all right, where am I sitting? And they're like, would you just try this one store? Would you just give it a shot? I'm like, sure. So I walk in. I go all along this, the left side. Jenny, no, okay. Jenny, how, no. All right, well, we tried. And then my wife said this. They have a big and tall section. Okay, heard that before. We go in there and I try on a shirt. And holla at your boy if it didn't fit like a glove. (laughs) As I'm demonstrating right now. Okay, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, uh, this shirt is so stinking comfy. It's like made with angel souls. It is, uh, you know, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm on point right now. I go, into the, I go into the changing room and my wife just starts bringing me more and more and every one I put on, I'm like, yeah, I think we should. <laughs> and uh, they're running a sale, 25% off. Well, you know what that means. Every fourth shirt's for fu- 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 free. <laughs> so I stack a bag and I walk out and, I, and I'm like, all right, I got, I got four shirts. I feel, I feel great. I, I'm not going to sweat all summer. And I'm um, standing up there, and I'm just like, man, that was just fantastic. I just, this is amazing. My wife goes, do you think we should go back in there and get the rest of the shirts? <laughs> so I went back in. And I go to the back, and Felicia B's there. There's two Felicias. Felicia B was there. Uh, you can be, hopefully she's watching this weekend because she's coming to women's conference and so is the, lady who, the other lady who checked us out because I'm not gonna tell you how long that receipt light was. Uh, kid you not, I bought every shirt they had there that was my size. I, I, had people, uh, I had people voting. I took the little folding table that had the wheelie chair and I put all the shirts that were my size and I was like, okay, let's do a quick vote. Only the unanimous ones are getting into the pile. 
and I stacked it. I, then I went to the front, and they're like, uh, Clayton, did you know you could get an extra 15% off? And I said, how do I do that? Sign up for the text message thing. So like, well, I already paid only 25% off on these shirts the first time around. They're like, well, you have to return all those. So I returned all of the shirts I had purchased for 25%, and then I purchased all of them for 40% off, and I walked out with two bags, which, listen to me, in the history of my life, I have never had two bags of clothes that fit me. Why does this matter to you? This is the closest thing that I can tell you about what it is like when you finally experience Jesus. I'm gonna tell you why. Track with me. You have searched in place after place after place after place, and everybody has told you that it's in pleasure, and everybody has told you it's in projects, and everybody's told you that if you finally get your house that you want, you'll finally be happy, and everybody's told you that if you have the right kind of dog, you'll be happy, and if you have the right kind of house, you'll be happy, and if you have the right kind of cars, you'll be happy, and then if you have more cars than the cars that you can possibly drive, if you finally have four cars, but you only have two drivers, then you'll be happy, and they've told you that if you get different kind of carpet you'll, in your house, you'll finally be happy, and they told you that if you repaint the walls, you'll finally be happy, and if you make those friends and you belong to those clubs and you have this kind of job and you make this kind of money and you have these kind of benefits, you've been told over and over and over again by people, if you just have this, then you'll be happy. And one day someone says something to you like, hey man, have you ever heard about Jesus? And you're like, man, I've tried everything and I'm not going to find it there either. And they go, oh, but would you, would you come in for a little bit and would you give Jesus just a chance? And you find yourself in an unassuming town at one of our unassuming campuses and someone talks to you about a person named Jesus and you try Jesus on a little bit and you're like, hold on a second. It fits. And man, does it feel good. And they're like, well, there, there's, not just, uh, there's not just forgiveness, there's mercy. And you're like, oh my goodness, mercy feels good too. And you're like, well, hold on a second, there's not just forgiveness and mercy, uh, there's grace And you're like, hold on a second, there's not just mercy and forgiveness and grace, there's also love. And you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I finally found it. And you go up to the register and you go to pay, and you're like, well, it's actually already been paid. And you're like, oh my goodness, and you you walk out of the store, and you're going, I can't believe that all of this was in there, I never would have guessed. And then somebody looks at you and he says, do you think you should go back in? And so you go, you go back in and you, you go to the place and you're, hold on a second, there's, there's meaning and there's significance and there's purpose and there's mission. All of this is there and it's, it's for me and it fits and I can have it. And you go up to the register and you're like, I was in here earlier And it was, I know the price was, I couldn't believe it, but I I picked up some additional items. And they're like, actually, these items are on sale too. If you and I could stop chasing all of the things that this world has to offer and finally chase Jesus, I am fully convinced that all the question marks in your soul will turn into exclamation marks. We're moving to a time of decision. For those of you in this room and watching online, I'll be quick because I went long and I apologize. I am ate up with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is the mission of this church is to help people find an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's some of you in this room or some of you watching online, you have watched everybody else walk out of the store lit up and excited about what they have found in Jesus. And you just keep peeking through the window going, man, it'd be nice if I could, and boy, it looks like they're super happy, but I don't know if they have my size. I'm telling you, oh, man, they have it. Jesus has the answer for all shapes and all sizes and all colors and all backgrounds and all economic statuses. He has what every single person is looking, but you are never going to experience what Christ has to offer by looking at him. It's only when you place your trust in him when you receive the work that he did for you on the cross, and here at the crossing, the way you start to experience that relationship with Jesus Christ is when you recognize that God's God and you're not, 
that you've sinned and you can't figure it out on your own, you can't pay it back on your own, there's a debt that you can't handle, and you recognize that when Jesus came, he lived a perfect and sinless life on your behalf, and he died on the cross on your behalf to purchase for you freedom and redemption and eternity, that the lower story is not your destiny, that there is something more coming later. And you go, you know what, I want that. And the way you receive that is when you become obedient in the area of baptism. And you allow yourself to model what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You allow yourself to be buried and brought back to life. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And some of you have been watching everybody else step into the newness and going, well, I'm not ready yet. It's like you're wearing burlap and just going, man, I just wish this wasn't so scratchy. And everybody around you is like, well, then take it off. Like you are walking in your own pain and your own misery for your, and it's your own choice. You could experience the healing power of Jesus if you want it. And if there's some of you in here today that have that question, you're in that spot, there's gonna be people over by the baptistry who'd love to just talk with you. Just have the conversation. For the rest of you who already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, when are we gonna become a, a brand ambassadors? Where we're going, look where, I mean, listen, man, there, I'm gonna get tons of emails this week. Molly's here, she'll handle them. I'll tell you exactly where I got them, because they're fly. I'm, I'm gonna be wearing one every week. When you see me, I'm gonna be like the be most beautiful plus size model the world has ever seen. When you find it and it means something to you, you can't help but become a brand ambassador. And if there's, if there's nothing in you that's welling up in gratitude towards God where you would talk about him, the problem's not with him. The problem's probably with us. And when we spend just a little bit of time on our knees just saying, God, help me to get that passion back, help me to get that right, would you stand with me? God, use this moment right here, right now to do a transforming work in this church. God, I know that all across this region, campus pastors are landing the plane right now. And I pray that people at all of our locations, including this one, would be willing to take a step of faith. Maybe it's getting down on their knees and praying or going over and talk to somebody about baptism. But God, we're believing and asking and begging you to do a work in us, not in the people around us, not in our row, but in us, us first. In your name I pray, amen.